Oh, hell yeah. This is episode 41 of Treasure Hunting for Nostalgia, where we never feed our mogwais after midnight. This is Brandon. This is Brad. This is Nick. So what was that, some type of Stone Cold Steve Austin? <laughs> oh, hell yeah. <laughs> you want to give some background as to why you're referencing Steve Stone Cold right now? Oh, because he's a badass. We were listening to uh, one of his podcasts on the way up here. We're in Reno. Just randomly, he just, when he gets excited, he says, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> in true Stone Cold fashion. Yeah, and he does... Open up a can of whoop ass. <laughs> he calls it audio whoop ass or something like yeah. that. Like re- audio recording whoop ass. He gets f- fired up about recording his podcast, I guess. Yeah, he does. <laughs> I can't remember what he was saying. Oh, hell yeah. About the, <laughs> It was something weird. Like some sort of like coffee drink that he had or something. I can't remember. What a big it was. cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> In his 96 Subaru. <laughs> I think it was a Suburban. Suburban, that's right. <laughs> Pretty much the same thing. <laughs> so Nacho and I were having racist jokes in the car. We went to Winco last week, and she was thinking about getting gifts for her friends for Valentine's Day. She has an Asian friend named Michaela, a Mexican friend named Nadia, and then a black friend named Anasia. Huh. So she was like, I don't know what to get Michaela. And I said, what about a big bag of white rice and she was heck of laughing oh man and she was like and i could get nadia some tacos <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and i could get anasia some macaroni and cheese i said what about watermelon she's like yeah that's even better oh man Dang. you should clarify that nadia is your black daughter correct? yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> so she was uh she was loving it <laughs> That's like a funny. <laughs> and uh, Willie, he has a midget at school. Like, <laughs> he's like a small, like, he's smaller than uh, Hoodwinked from WWF. Hornswoggle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, he had like, tried to mack on these girls one time. I was out in the car waiting for the kids to get out of school, and he was walking by. And he said, what's up to these girls? And they're like, oh, who left their kid out here? Oh, man. <laughs> he had, had got shot down. <laughs> I felt kind of bad for him, but I still laughed when I was in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Hornswoggle was doing some things on those Royal Rumbles that we were watching, though. He was heck of funny. He was imitating wrestlers' moves. He did a, I guess it was called an FU at the time, but... Now known as the Attitude Adjustment mm-hmm. by John Cena. That was pretty tight. And, and did sweet shin music. <laughs> shin music. Emphasis on the S and shin. And he kept imitating CM Punk's taunts. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. Yeah. So since we're in Reno, uh, I, I actually got this idea from Bill Simmons, who is a sports podcaster. Uh, we decided to make some friendly wagers amongst each other we were watching some old royal rumbles and uh what we did was we each put five bucks into a pot not literally a pot but you know what i mean and uh we drew numbers one through 30 and basically those are our numbers like whatever number we have corresponds to the number that the the wrestler would enter into the royal rumble so that basically you'd be rooting for that person, and if they won, you, you just took the whole the whole pot. It's it a lot of fun. I highly recommend it if you uh, at the next Royal Rumble, or if, you, if ever you have any old school Royal Rumbles to watch, it's a lot of fun. It's <clears throat> gonna be uh, came on with this WWE Network. Oh man, heck of Royal Rumbles. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of a bummer if you know who wins. Like uh, the first one that we watched. Uh, Brandon found out who won, I guess, just because it said on the back of the the DVD case. But uh, he he managed to keep it secret from Brad and I. Appreciate that. It made it enjo- more enjoyable. Yeah, more fun. The shitty thing is that Brad won both of them. We tried to watch a third one, but uh, I guess our internet connection is not good enough. Or we we tried to watch it on Brad's laptop and it kept overheating or something. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a lot of fun. Um, you could even make side bets, like whoever gets eliminated the fastest, you win two dollars from each player, or you know there might be even a, a you know a pot for gimmick characters like Hornswoggle or <laughs> Dink. But 
you actually have to agree upon if it's a gimmick character or not. So that's why we didn't do that. But otherwise, it was a lot of fun. So what's in your lunchbox? Treasure. You want to do some treasure hunting? Sure. Okay, so I guess I'll just reveal both of mine at first. One's kind of obscure. Oh, great. <laughs> Was it another PC game? Nope. We should give like a description of the setting right now. <laughs> uh, it's nighttime. Uh, the curtains are drawn. They're uh, purple or red and green. There's some fancy art on the walls. I was talking more about the position that you two are in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not in our uh usual you know chair table setup where actually Nick has a table and a mic and a chair <laughs> Brad and I are comfortably sitting in a queen size bed <laughs> not king queen size it's uh, about 15 after 12 so midnight ish we're really sleepy tired <laughs> I don't usually stay up this late and we're both in our underwear I'm about to be naked here in a minute. Oh, man. <laughs> You're welcome to sleep in my bed if you want, Brandon. <laughs> uh, so here's my first item. This is the non-obscure item. Warriors Orochi for the PlayStation 2. The world of Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors are about to collide. That's right. Now... Here's my next item. It, it's, it's actually pretty rare. It's a Canadian McDonald's toy. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a trophy, the um, Venzina hockey trophy. Did I say that right? Hockey trophies have a lot of weird names, so I'm not going to pretend to know all of them. But I'm guessing it's probably Venezia. Venezia, that's right. There's the card in here, too. Don't do too much damage to that box. That's the card? Yes! So this is the item that's going to get voided from yours from last week, the most expensive treasure. Last week I won, so... Some gold gold. Oh! Gold gold. <laughs> Legend of Zelda. That's sick. Pretty good shape, too. Mm -hmm. Too bad it's not the gray card. It's very shiny. Tight. And then this. Whoa, Contra the Alien Wars for Game Boy? That's tight. Yep. Another Game Boy game? Brought to you by Billy <laughs> Zogel. <laughs> hate that guy. Pokemon Silver. That's tight. Yep. That's it. That's all I have. Pokemon Silver, Contra for Game Boy, and Legend of Zelda. Go ahead, faggot. Roll your roll. <laughs> With your fucking gay-ass Benzina trophy. Benzina. <laughs> we forgot to say, what's in the box? Yeah. <laughs> 8, 3, and 15. Ooh, I feel some pain coming on. <laughs> Five dollar added to my bank. Corn dog. Critical attack. Void two items next week. I'm gonna pick that one. I will pick that one. Would you want me to roll for you? Twenty. Nut tap. Eighteen. Taxi. Eleven. Taxi. Buy dinner ten dollars. Taxi. <laughs> no nut tap, huh? <laughs> That's suitable. That'll do well. So in honor of being in a hotel, <laughs> we are doing our top five 
movies that take place in hotels slash motels slash holiday inns. Say what? Say what? <laughs> oh, let's roll to see who gets to go first. Nick rolls one. I roll eight. Brandon rolls three. Huh. Dang, Heck low low. rolls. So I'll start. Number five on my list. You you guys may be thinking I picked the wizard. I didn't. <laughs> it does take place in a hotel some parts. A lot of parts do. Yeah. It's gonna be room uh not room, but fourteen oh eight. Oh, that's a good one, John Kuzak. Uh Mike Inslin is a unpreposterous skeptical author who, after the death of his daughter Katie, writes books appraising supernatural events in which he has no belief. So he's kind of like a slacker guy, just doesn't know what to do with his life, trying to find supernatural elements. After his latest book, he receives an anonymous postcard depicting the Dolphin, a hotel on Lexington Avenue in New York, bearing the message, do not enter 1408. Viewing this as a challenge, Mike forces the hotel to allow him to book and stay a room. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson is actually the manager. He plays a pretty good role. He's always in good roles. Uh, it's so low on my list because it's it's kind of predictable. I kind of knew it was going to happen, but uh, it's based off of a Stephen King book, and it's a horror movie, and it's a really good movie. That part where the man was in the room was heck creepy. Yeah, that was that was pretty good. Did you see that movie, Nick? No, I I did not see that movie. No. Nick's not a big horror fan. Yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> no, I don't know. I'll see it if I have the opportunity, I guess. I have it. You could borrow it. He was probably hoping you didn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. So that was my number five, 1408. Number five on my list is 3,000 Miles to Graceland. Wasn't that on your <laughs> top five <laughs> gambling, Vegas, yeah. gambling movies? Yeah. <laughs> Well, this also takes place in a hotel, <laughs> or actually a motel. Kurt Russell, Kevin Costner, both Elvis impersonators. One's good, one's bad. Do you want to go in about the scorpion again in the beginning, the two scorpions fighting with the symbolism? <laughs> I may sound kind of redundant going over that, but yeah, in the beginning there's this cool CGI scorpion battle with a white and a black scorpion. That turns out to be the main characters fighting it out. <laughs> fighting it out. <laughs> and throughout the whole movie trying to get this stolen money. Basically, they're bank robbers. They steal... Uh, or casino robbers. And they steal all this money from a casino dressed as Elvis impersonators during an Elvis impersonator convention. And um, Kurt Russell hides the money. Kevin Costner comes back for it. Uh, Courtney Cox is in it, which kind of sucks. But <laughs> other than that, it's a great movie. All right, so my number five is honestly my favorite movie on this list, but it has the least to do with hotels or motels, so I put it at number five, but I couldn't just keep it off the list. The climax of the movie takes place in a hotel, so it, it had to be on my list. It tells the story of Lloyd Christmas and Harry <laughs> John yes. and their epic journey from Providence, Rhode Island to Aspen, Colorado. It's got to be Dumb and Dumber. Uh, you, 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 pull, you pulled a Bartholomew on this one, really no, stretching it. The climax takes place in a hotel. The last, like, the, the 20 whole, minutes the of the movie. The third act, yeah, the whole third <laughs> act does. Uh, so, basically, it, t it tells the their story about going from um, Providence, Rhode Island, to Aspen, Colorado, to uh, deliver this briefcase to this woman named uh, Mary Swanson. Who, uh, yeah, Mary Swanson, that's Samsonite. right. Samsonite. Samsonite. Um... So the way that the, the last scene takes place, um, Lloyd and uh, Harry get to this hotel because that, that's where they're staying in Aspen. Uh, he find, Lloyd is in love with this girl, Mary Swanson. He finally gets her to come to the hotel because he has this suitcase full of money that she's been looking for. And uh, <laughs> while she's there, he confesses her, his love for her. And she tells him that he ha has a one in a million chance and he takes this as a, as a good sign. Like, oh, I still have a chance then, is what you're saying. <laughs> um, but at, right right after that happens, the uh, the reason the money is significant is because her husband has been kidnapped and that money is ransom money for her husband. So the kidnappers bust in. They end up holding uh, Lloyd and uh, Mary hostage. 
because the, the briefcase is full of nothing but IOUs from uh, fr- from what Harry and uh, Lloyd had spent already. <laughs> uh, and then after that, the the FBI comes in and they bust the uh, the uh, the kidnappers. The you know, and uh, that's pretty much how the movie ends. Uh, Mary gets hooked up back with her husband and. Lloyd has some pretty dark thoughts about what he's going to do about that, but he never actually follows through on it. But, uh, yeah, that whole last, the the, the last scene of the movie all takes place in, the, in a hotel. So Yeah, as soon as they find out the money's in the briefcase. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's got so many great lines in it, so many oh, great man. scenes. Yeah, for sure. There's one that I like to point out in, in which when Harry and Lloyd is trying to make the uh, the guy who's, one of the bad guys eat a, a spicy hamburger <laughs> and they're like uh why don't you eat your hamburger and then we'll tell you and they start laughing at themselves <laughs> and that's how me brandon and al van felt at nick's birthday party <laughs> what? when we stuffed the dirty cheetah drawers in your bag <laughs> <laughs> i had these uh sweaty silky <laughs> cheetah underwear they're like boxers <laughs> and so uh i was like man i need to cheat these underwear off and al van goes why don't you put him in Nick's bag, his soccer bag or his gym bag? That was a heck of a good idea. So I went to the bathroom and took him off. And, of course, Nick was entertaining the whole group. We were at a restaurant, and uh, he didn't notice. (laughs) And then we put the underwear, or I put the underwear in his bag, and it's like, Whenever he'd look over at us, we'd just start, like, busting up, like, (laughs) laughing at ourselves, like, he's going to find (laughs) us. <laughs> and Alvan was he actually said, dude, this is like dumb and dumber when they put the hot peppers on the hamburger. <laughs> nice. Number four on my list is going to be Four Rooms. Uh Four Rooms is an anthology comedy film directed by four directors that has Allison Anders, Alexandria Rockwell, Robert Rodriguez, and of course Quentin Tarantino, each directing one segment of the film. The story is set in a fictional Hotel Monsignor in Los Angeles on New Year's Eve. Tim Roth plays the hotel bellhop on his first day. Uh, who His job consists of four very different encounters with various hotel guests. I like the movie because it's original, it's funny, and well shot. The four stories uh, are The Missing Ingredient, The Misbehaviors, The Wrong Man, and The Man from Hollywood, which is my favorite story. If you guys haven't of seen it. Of course it's your favorite story. Of course, because it's written by Quentin Tarantino. That's the best one. That one, and um, I like The Misbehaviors, too, a lot. But it's a really good movie. Uh, I, we watched it when we were little, and Mom rented it. Not appropriate for kids. Uh, the Missing Ingredient. There's a coven of witches Some who show kiddies. up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a coven of witches who show up trying to summon a go- one of their goddesses. And they have a big cauldron, of course, one of them, who I believe is played by Ion Sky. Her, she's supposed to bring semen, but instead of bringing it, she actually swallowed it in the heat of the moment. <laughs> so they get Tim Roth and they get him to, uh, they bait him in the the cauldron and have sex with him. So the semen leaks out of her and gets, that's the last ingredient. <laughs> so that was my number four. That was also my number one, actually. Uh, Your number one? Yeah. Oh, well, only because it was to me it's the most relevant hotel movie but maybe you guys have something better I don't know I didn't really have anything to add on to it other than that I agree that the, the Quentin Tarantino story is the best of course it is Brandon it is it's, what's it's your awesome favorite story, story? Misbehaviors. Yeah, right. It is. You liar. No. I'm you don't lying. even remember it. Yeah, I do. With Antonio Banderas. Who directed it? Uh, Robert Rodriguez. No, he didn't. Yes, he did because Antonio <laughs> Banderas is yeah. in it. <laughs> Lucky guess. Uh, let's see. Number four on my list is The Shining, but the TV show <laughs> version, the miniseries. <laughs> Isn't this movies that take place in a hotel? It is a movie. It's a TV miniseries. Yeah, it's still a movie because I own the DVD. Okay. Uh, like Twitches. <laughs> it uh, it um, blows Kubrick's version out of the water, in my opinion. <laughs> I highly disagree with that. Have you seen Who's it? Who's this Hack Kubrick you're talking about? Huh? It sounds like a hack. Hack Kubrick? Yeah. 
uh, I've Stanley. Never heard of him before. Stanley Cooper. Oh, that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's all right. Not not in The Shining. He he couldn't. <laughs> uh, he he didn't do it justice. But the <laughs> the miniseries was three parts. Uh, it starred the dude from Wings. <laughs> <laughs> And does he play the role to, that Jack Nicholson plays? Yeah, he does. <laughs> Who's this Jack Nicholson? He, he's a nobody, too. He was in Wolf. Oh. <laughs> well, I think he was the Joker, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a very lackluster Joker. <laughs> but um, in this version, uh, the kid who plays Danny, I think, does a better part than the other little boy. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember the kid's name. <laughs> and the the... The demons are scarier, and uh, the ghosts. And that's... that be, that movie that TV series uh-huh, <laughs> was made for super fans of Stephen King. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's why it's better because Kubrick did his own thing and he like pissed all over. No, the, he didn't. Pissed all over it. No, he didn't. Or are you gonna go jerk off to some Kubrick <laughs> movies after you watch Pulp Fiction again? <laughs> That's my number four of The Shining. TV. Why are you Why are you dissing Pulp Fiction? <laughs> What's going on here? Just because Brad gets a boner off of him and Quentin Tarantino and Pulp Fiction. I've never physically gotten a boner on any movie. Figuratively. Okay. <laughs> the uh, The lead character from my number four looks exactly like Ken Chaney. Hmm. With or without the long hair. Um, I think he probably would still look like Ken Cheney regardless of mm. his hairstyling. Do you know an actor who looks like Ken Cheney? Nothing comes to Jason Siegel? <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. Do you know what movie it is? It's probably my number three. Is it? Forgetting Sarah Marshall? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Uh, directed by Nicholas Stoller, produced by Judd Apatow. It's a... Uh, Decent romantic comedy for, you know, I guess it's as good as a romantic comedy can possibly be, I guess. Um, Jason Siegel and Russell Brand are pretty funny in it. Um, like I said, Jason Siegel reminds me of an uh, old friend that I have named Ken Chaney. He always brings a smile to my face just because I, I miss that guy. Um, you you get to see Jason Siegel's penis in this movie, so that's that that's twice up a notch. Twice? Twice. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen it. I only remember the one time. Did you get a boner during that part? No. Oh, dang. Uh, so Jason Siegel plays a uh, television music composer who's dating this character named Sarah Marshall, played by Kristen Bell. Uh, she's an actress whose career seems to be trending upward, and she breaks up with um, Jason Siegel's character to be with, uh, uh, what's his name, Russell Brand's character, who's like this English rock star guy. Um, and then to get to kind of get over Sarah Marshall, uh, Jason Siegel's character goes to Hawaii to stay in this really luxurious hotel and just ironically, coincidentally, she, he and, uh, Kristen Bell, Sarah Marshall are, are staying at the same hotel. So a lot of the, the important scenes in the movie take place in the hotel, like the scenes where they're like having sex in the rooms adjacent to each other and they're like competing to see who can make the, the loudest noises during sex and so just a lot of funny stuff that happens. That's pretty much all I had to say about that. Oh, I do like the uh, the Dracula musical too. Yeah, that's what I put on here too, the Dracula musical at the end. Yeah. Uh, I did have a few things I wanted to say about it. Uh, Sarah Marshall's television show is called Crime Scene, Scene of the Crime. <laughs> also, uh, my favorite quote in the movie is made by Aldous Snow when they first show up at the hotel, and Aldous is holding one one of his sandals. <laughs> Have you seen my other one yeah. of these? He says, I've lost a shoe. Have you seen it anywhere? Excuse me, missus. I've lost a shoe. Like this one. It's like this one's fellow. It's sort of the exact opposite, in fact. <laughs> Not an evil version, but just, you know, a shoe like this, but for the other foot. Otherwise, I'd have two, right? <laughs> and it just sets the whole tone of the movie. He's like this some idiot rock star. <coughs> and uh, Jonah Hell has a good uh, role in that. Um, his quote, I just went from six to midnight. Genius. First time I heard that was in that movie. Um, 
Yeah, a lot of good moments in that movie as well. I like when uh, he's in the yoga class and he's like, I'm doing a handstand, motherfucker. <laughs> I think that's only on the director's cut. Yeah, I think so. <sighs> so that was my number three, was Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Number three on my list is Devil's Rejects. Is that on your list? <coughs> Freaky movie. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Uh, it tells a tale of... Uh, the, um, the 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 rest of my two are non hipster movies. Uh, Devil Rejects is a hipster movie. Yeah, that and the New Shining. Oh, <laughs> you're, you're just making that up. <laughs> I don't take offense to that because I'm not a hipster. I I don't think a hipster would be laying in a bed. Recording a podcast in the tank top and underwear. I'm sure they'd have a cigarette next to them in an ashtray with a scarf. With a fully drawn syringe of heroin. Uh, uh, and some whiskey without ice. <laughs> <laughs> and a fedora to top it off. Uh, but Devil's Rejects uh, tells the extension to House of a Thousand Corpses, the crazy family with... Uh, Sherry Moon and Sid Haig, who you actually got to get an autograph from. And he charged me. Of course. You know they charge during conventions. Yeah. And uh, basically, uh, they uh, are escaping the law, who is actually a pretty funny turn of events, because in the end, you're rooting for them and not the, the lawbringers, because the law guy's a dickhead. Yeah. But... Um, one of the parts that really freaked me out was when Bill Mosley forced the girl to give him a blowjob, the mom, in front of the other two girls. I was like, damn, that's pretty dark. And um, the part where the, he throws his... I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this for you, Nick. All right, there's no chance I'll ever watch this movie. <laughs> when he, he gets the boyfriend's face and throws it on the girl and she goes running out in the hotel freaking out. And gets hit by the truck. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Pretty twisted, crazy movie. Uh, Rob Zombie's mm, third, second, third, I'll say third best movie behind Halloween and House of a Thousand Corpses. Maybe El Super Bisto, but. No, no, not El Super Bisto. <laughs> uh, yeah, but definitely dark and sinister. Yeah, and uh, the Sid Haig signed my House of a Thousand Corpses and said, hey, Brad, shit the bed, Sid Haig. So that's pretty cool. And he wrote it in silver pen so it shows up on the DVD sleeve. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. My number three, I kind of went off the board on this one as well. Um, it's a movie that I recently borrowed from Brad, Coen Brothers film, No Country for Old Men from 2007. Um, as I said, I, I borrowed it from Brad because I uh, had recently seen There Will Be Blood, and I know those two movies kind of, they were released almost like within a month or two of each other. And they were kind of compared to each to each other because they're just very dark, uh, dark films. Uh, the the plot points are just kind of, are kind of just really about these sad characters and what they do to get along in life. <clears throat> uh, in my opinion, There Will Be Blood was a better movie. It didn't do as well with the Academy, but uh, I I'm a really big Daniel Day Lewis fan, so I'm I'm kind of biased there. But I thought it was a better movie. But uh, No Country for Old Men was a good movie. Um, it's basically about this guy named Llewellyn Moss, uh, who's played by Josh Brolin, who stumbles across a uh, fortune of drug money out in the de out in the middle of the desert. Um, soon after that, you know, he's being tailed by not only the rightful owner of the money, but also law enforcement trying to, you know, find the guy. So the the majority of the movie is is about this Llewellyn Moss character just evading the law and evading this this guy named Anton, this sadistic killer. Who Anton carries, Sugar. Yeah, he's a badass. Oh, man. He's, he's a monster. Most, he's, I think he saves this movie just because he's just so intense. and yeah. he, He's just stone-faced all the time. And the, the way that he kills people with that little air pressure device that he has, and he, the shotgun has like that little circular silencer thing on yeah. it. It's, it's badass. Um, so, yeah, Anton is a badass character he's played by Har javier bardem uh where was i so 
So Llewellyn Moss is, is basically hiding out in hotels the rest of the movie. That's why it made it onto my list. One of the, the most intense scenes for me is when he's in the room adjacent to uh, yeah. Anton. And he had hid the uh, the suitcase, or I think it was a bag, in the, in the vent. And the vent's actually connected between the two rooms. So there's Anton in one room. Uh, Llewellyn in the other room, and then the, and then the vet is is the money where they're what they're both what they both want. It's just such an intense scene because he he's right there. And if he knew he knows that he's there, he's gonna kill him instantly. But uh, Llewellyn Moss uh, evades him that time, and he he goes to another hotel. He manages to evade him again. He actually uh, gets a shot off on Anton. Yeah. He injures him. Uh, Llewellyn's injured as well. And he goes over to Mexico to get some sort of treatment. I can't remember what happened to him, though. I think he got shot, like, in his chest or something like that. Or maybe a shoulder. And then it's weird <laughs> because at the end, they don't show what happens to him. But then they show him, like, on the floor dead. So they don't show how he died. That, that's when uh, Tommy Lee Jones' character yeah. just shows up at that hotel when um, there's a bunch of trucks leaving. Like, yeah. the drug, the Mexican drug cartel guys uh, obviously caught up to him and took care of him. Yeah, but it's a good movie, and there's a lot of good scenes that happen in hotels, so that's why it made it onto my list. <clears throat> Number two on my list is going to be the main character. His name is Anthony Perkins, Psycho, 1960. See, I would have gone for, with the Vince Vaughn version. Oh come on, <laughs> that's bullshit. <laughs> Vince Vaughn and Anne Hache. <laughs> You got a homo and a lesbian in the same movie. Nice. <laughs> Vince Vaughn's gay? Yes. Is he? Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I still I convince you that Rebecca Black was John Stamos' daughter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's not. <laughs> that was part of an email chain one day. I remember that. That was heck of funny. I, I actually participated in, in the convincing of Brandon in that as well. That I took I took Nick off the email and was like, dude, I'm going to totally <laughs> convince Brandon that Rebecca Black is John Stamos' daughter. It still didn't waive my decision on what was a better song, that Friday, Friday, or Call Me Maybe. No, it didn't. But you were like, oh, I didn't know he was his, that was his daughter. <laughs> So, uh, back to Psycho. Uh, I love Psycho. Anthony Perkins, who played Norman Bates, is one of the greatest human monsters ever put into film. Uh, the music in the film is amazing. That's what really grabbed me. It's one of the things I remember about it most is just the whole violins and the creaking. And every time the, uh, the mom comes out and with the violins, it just, I love that part. Uh, they had a few uh, sequels, actually, in which Norman Bates kept getting released from the mental institution. And he was in Psycho 2, 3, and 4, which I haven't watched in a long time. I watched him with Mom when we were, like, 5 or 6, but I don't remember much about him. Uh, I re I'm really a fan of the Bates Motel series, and uh, but the original Psycho. When we actually got to Universal Studios and saw the Bates Motel, that was so awesome. Mm. And Norman's mom's house, that was pretty cool. So that's number two on my list. Number two on my list list stars John Cusack. It's Identity. Oh, I've seen that movie. Have you seen Identity? Uh -huh. It's a uh, a psychological thriller. Uh, very well done. I uh, can't say much without spoiling it, but basically, it takes place in a hotel with about seven or eight people. Um, and there's a killer on the loose, uh, taking down everyone one by one. Uh, but you really don't expect what actually ha is ha is going on. Uh, it's nothing supernatural, but um, amazing movie. And the ending, that one threw me for a loop. I did, could not even predict what was going to happen. And I don't want to talk about much talk much of it because uh, I think Nick should watch it. Yeah, it's a great movie. Hmm. That I might actually watch. It's got John Cusack in it. He's sexy. Say anything. Yes. He's no Ewan McGregor, though. Oh, no way. Uh, I Own Sky was in Say Anything. You know she dated Anthony Kiedis? Did not know that. Yep. 
That was my number two <clears throat> identity. That was a load she swallowed. Yeah. <laughs> my number two is the 1980 version of The Shining, directed by some guy named Stanley Kubrick. I don't know. Some hack. I don't know. That's uh, crazy. <laughs> Brandon basically ta- talked about all the cool scenes. Uh, Jack Nicholson is the uh, the main character. He's basically he's a writer who takes a job as an off-season caretaker of uh, this hotel called the Overlook Hotel. Uh, he brings his family with him, his wife and son. Uh, they find out that his son has some sort of psychic abilities, and he's able to channel these ghosts who inhabit the the hotel. Eventually, the ghosts um, take over Jack, and he turns into a fucking weirdo. He basically tries to murder his family. Um, it's, it's very low. Uh, if I was to list Stanley Kubrick movies, it'd probably be at the bottom of my list. I haven't seen all of them, but Doctor Strangelove, 2001, Clockwork Orange, Full Metal Jacket, Eyes Wide Shut. I would rank all those movies above The Shining, but those movies don't take place in a hotel, so... The Shining's on my number two list. I could not, I could not get into the 2001. It is. I watched it the first time I watched it. I think it was actually in that film Drum class, class that yeah. we had together at American River College. I was. I couldn't get into it either. The first 30 minutes are just. It's just space. It's just yeah. floating around in space with some classical instrumental stuff, which is kind of cool, but it's not really what I want to see when I go to the movies. Not that I ever saw it in a movie theater, but you know what I mean. But I watched it again, and uh, I, I liked it a lot more. Mm. You might want to try it again. There's this movie out there called Brazil. Have you ever heard about it? Sounds somewhat familiar. It's uh, from a foreign country, but um, it's this futuristic movie. Uh, from what I saw, it's this guy with wings flying like forever, trying to get to some destination. Uh-huh. Apparently, that movie was edited and cut for the United States to make it completely not make any sense on purpose. Hmm. And I guess the original version is supposed to be uh, way better, but I remember seeing that movie uh, with the 2001, like I was watching it at the same time uh, in film class and then watching Brazil and I was like, man, these two movies suck dick. (laughs) My number one movie is going to be the best Shining version ever, 1980 Stanley Kubrick nice. version. Didn't we just talk about this? We did. <laughs> um, I just want to add, I, I was amazed at how much detail Stanley Kubrick put in it, if you really pay attention to it and watch it. If you watch Room 237, with the documentary on it, they reveal a whole bunch of stuff on it that went on behind the scenes. Like, um, they actually take two films. Uh, they played one normal ways and the other one backwards and at one point when it um met up and it it like spelled out like stanley's name or something it was pretty cool coincidence yeah and um (laughs) stephen quote stephen quote stephen king has been quoted saying that although kubrick made the film with memorial imagery it was not a good adaptation of his novel this is the one case that i feel like the I'm fine with the movie outshining the book, no pun intended. Um, it actually took, he took it in a whole different direction, and I think Shelley Duvall did way better job than whoever that blonde chick was in the TV series. <laughs> the original Danny was better, and of course Jack Nicholson was way better than Stephen Weber, I think his name is. That's Steven right. <laughs> the favorite part is actually... The, all the ghosts coming together and seeing Jack go into his insanity and even like Danny going on his big will they even show like the route that he takes and it shouldn't make sense but they made it made sense in the movie like where he turned corners they actually move the set and it's not supposed to make sense and they actually show where he's supposed to be going there's like an invisible wall and invisible window you just have to watch the room, room 237 and you'll see it but the first time I watched Room 237, I actually watched it back to back. I watched it again as soon as I got done with it. Huh. Um, it's a really good documentary uh, for a really great movie. Way better than the TV series. Yeah, like the I, I stopped watching Room 237 because they are like, oh, look. Look at where this hat is placed when this guy moves his briefcase luggage down the hallway. Yeah. They're like, this is fucking retarded. <laughs> it's Kubrick. Kubrick was a genius. 
like Nick said, he has you know Clockwork Orange, one of my favorite movies. Eyed Wide Shut is like a great movie, phenomenal. Um, everything he touched was pure magic. So he's the ultimate hipster. Oh, <laughs> I think the guy who invented Pips, Pepsi is the ultimate oh, hipster. Fuck. What a comeback. <laughs> you know, I saw a um, picture of CM Punk on a wrestling magazine a few weeks ago uh, with a bunch of other superstars, and his Pepsi tattoo has, it. they color imaged it blue and blue instead of red and blue because they didn't want to advertise yeah. their Pepsi. Lamos. <laughs> Number one on my list stars Michael Shannon. Who also played Zod in Man of Steel. It's a movie called Bug. Oh, fuck. What? Bug? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Did you watch it? Yes. That was a freaky movie. Yeah, it's crazy insane. Uh, Ashley Judd is in it, yeah. I believe. Uh, it tells the tale of Ashley Judd and her friend meeting up with this guy who is Michael Shannon. Um uh, to- totally normal guy to begin with. He's a little weird. Barricades himself in a in a hotel room later on, and he thinks that there's bugs in the room and on his skin. So uh, Ashley Judd moves in with him in the hotel room, and they turn into paranoid schizophrenics, uh, doing drugs and thinking there's bugs everywhere. This guy's picking sores uh, off his skin, and they're both going insane with. The idea that there's these bugs that are planted in the room by the government. And uh, it's just a r- crazy movie. Uh, have you ever seen it, Nick? No, i never heard uh, of it. Uh, it's, um, it's another one where the ending's pretty crazy. And the guy, Michael Shannon, actually reprised his role in the movie. He did a uh, play about it, like on Broadway or something. And they liked it so much they turned it into a movie and had him come back as the lead actor. But it's crazy, uh, psychological, and you don't know what's going on. Like, if you've seen the bugs, is he, are they fake? Are they real? Uh, it's just crazy. Yeah, that, that kind of reminded me of a cross between um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and Black Swan. Why Black Swan? Because it has crazy moments in it, too. Does it? Like with her picking her skin off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess that is right. And doesn't she, like, grow feathers or something? Yeah. It's a good movie. Mm-hmm. Made by the same guy who made Requiem for a Dream. Jared Leto? No. <laughs> Jared Leto didn't make it. Oh. It was, like, Andre or Arnofsky or something like that. <laughs> was it that Roman Arlovsky guy? Who did Silent Hill? No. It was Darren Aronofsky. Hmm. That Michael Shannon dude's fucking ugly. <laughs> I was just looking at him. He on is in bug too when he's on doing drugs. Yeah, he's disturbing looking. Yeah. That's what he makes the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Aronofsky also did Pie. Yeah, I've seen that movie. That movie's pretty good. Yeah, I saw it a long time ago also. I remember when I uh, watched Cube, I was like, this is the best movie in the world. <laughs> and I yeah. uh, rented it at Blockbuster and took it over to Nick's house and we watched it outside of, on his patio. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I think on a ping pong table. <laughs> and um, I don't think you and Aaron appreciated it as much as I did. <laughs> <laughs> I only remember bits and pieces of it. <laughs> I remember waking up and watching Moonwalker at That's Nick's so house, tight. and uh, Aaron, we were talking, and it's near the end of the movie, and Aaron's like, no, you guys got to watch, you're going to miss this part, <laughs> and it's when Michael Jackson like grabs this girl's head and puts it in his crotch, <laughs> he's like, you're going to miss it, watch, watch, you can't rewind it, so I think it was on TV. Uh, no, I had that on VHS. Oh, did you? It might have been on, t- might, maybe like VH1 or something like that, but I did have it on video. Back in the day, that Aronofsky that guy also did the wrestler. This hmm. guy's kind of a savage. Who did what? What did Aronofsky do that we were originally talking about? Back Re- before Re- a dream. Uh, oh, okay. And Black Swan. Oh, okay. Good shit. Before oh, my number one was Four Rooms. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, I don't have anything to add about it. I think Tim Roth is hilarious in it though. 
I forgot about that. So being in Reno, we actually want to talk about what our favorite things to gamble on. So um, I guess we'll just go around and discuss this. What do you like to gamble on, Brandon? Scratchers. <laughs> <laughs> Scratchers. Yeah, I mean, I could, you know, I, I'll get into a phase where I'll, I'll buy a bunch of scratchers and then I learn, I know better, and then I stop. Yeah, I'll, like I'll maybe um, once every two or three weeks, I'll maybe spend ten bucks on some scratchers and um, just take my winnings from there and go on. A few weeks ago, I bought a ten dollar scratcher. They have twenty dollar scratchers I now. I bought the ten dollar black one, and I won twenty. So then I pocketed ten, and got another black one, and then won fifteen. Pocketed the five, so I could get some sushi with the other ten, and then bought another black, and then didn't win any. I won the biggest winning I had out of scratcher is on the way back from San Diego. This last year, after Karen got her butt hurt and Brandon got the mighty corn dog, <laughs> after that trip we were on our way home and I bought a stash the money in the jar, and it was a hundred dollar ticket. I was so excited. That's awesome. I also like to um, put my wagers on uh, Royal Rumbles. <laughs> yeah, that's that ter- that's quickly becoming my number one means of gambling. And um, blackjack, I liked at first, but it's not. A very dependable game. <laughs> uh, you could win and lose very easily. And then people get mad at you when you do the wrong thing. Like, <laughs> oh, now you're going to give me the 10. And then not only do I end up busting, then but the other guys <laughs> end up busting because I, I hit too many times or <laughs> I'll stay on 12 because I don't like busting. And... I hate hitting on 12. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I always get 22. Exactly. And then people are like, then they give it, then they say like, oh man, now I get the ten and now you get the ten and now I, now I busted. Like, <laughs> yep, you didn't have to take the ten. You could have stayed at seven. Exactly. <laughs> I don't have anything to add about scratchers. I've never bought a scratcher in my life. Oh man, I, I have received a couple of them like in my stocking or whatever the, during Christmas time, and I've never won anything. So that's probably why I never bought one. Um. This Royal Rumble thing really is a ton of fun. I'm looking forward to doing more of those. Um, I do like Blackjack a lot. Um, from what I have read and have, have seen, I haven't done the math myself, but they say that Blackjack is statistically the best game to play in terms of your odds against the house. I think it's something like you have a 48% chance to their 52% chance of, of winning. So, you know, I mean, if you play for a long time, eventually you're going to lose. But statistically, if you just, it, you, you should break even most times. Um, so that's why I like it. It's just, a, it's just a fun game and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But it shouldn't be a whole lot of money as long as you're playing with the, what they call the optimal strategy. Uh, but what I really love playing is poker, which is a large part of the reason why we're here in Reno because they have legalized online poker in uh, the states of Nevada, New Jersey, and Delaware. Um, So we had to move from one hotel room to another because the first hotel room they had us in was at the end of this hallway and the Wi-Fi connection sucked ass. It's like it was a quarter mile hallway. It was a Kubrickian (laughs) hallway. (laughs) Kubrickian. So uh, we went down to the... um, the registration area, the hotel registration area, and told them what our issue was, and they were very kind and let us move to another uh, room. Uh, so now we're in a different room. Our Wi-Fi connection kicks ass now, so very happy. Been playing poker for quite a quite a bit since we've gotten here. Been for room. <laughs> yeah, they had they had already given our room out by by the time we were leaving. We we only took maybe like 30, 40 minutes. Because we were heading up there, to, we had ordered a pizza while we were downstairs uh, getting our room switched, so we would just decided to eat it and then we would leave. And then by the time we were leaving, like someone started knocking on our door, I was like, oh, I guess this must be the hotel people that are going to clean up before they, you know, release it to someone else. But no, they already released it to someone else. It was an older couple, old, older couple that uh, they had assigned the room to. And I told them why we were leaving. They're like, well, I want Wi-Fi connection too. 
Well, you're going to have to take that up with the, the hotel clerk, I guess. You know they didn't know how to use Wi-Fi. They were <laughs> heck of old. So we got a mini fridge. Uh, here's a pro tip for you guys. If you guys ever want a mini fridge for your hotel room, a free one, just say that you have, you're have diabetic dependent on insulin, and they'll uh, bring you a hotel r fridge free of charge. We didn't want to have the guy come in and move the fridge, so Brandon just carried it down the Kubrickian hallway, down the elevator to the, our other room, which is actually closer to the elevator, which is nice. And then we carried all the bags. And, um, yeah, poker is my favorite thing to gamble on, too. It's It involves skill. It, it's... Uh, you know, it has a luck element to it, but it's mostly skill, which I like. I bet you those old people were going to try to attach their typewriter to the Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, the, the guy was like, man, I wanted you to give me a gummer. Oh. To who? <laughs> to you? No, to the old lady. <laughs> oh. Why do they need Wi-Fi for that, though? They don't. So he just said that randomly? Yeah, I heard him. <laughs> no, when I, I, I left one of my bags in the room, and I had to go back and get it, and uh, they were still there, and the the ladies on the phone, I don't want my husband to carry all the, all the luggage back down. I need to know what room I'm going to be in. Apparently, they couldn't give her a room number on the line she was calling in, so they had to go back down to the concierge. And how are they going to get the keys? They can't switch over the keys they just no, gave them. they can't. Yeah. So I was like, maybe I should help them move. Their... Then I was like, no. I've got Royal Rumble to watch. Being the selfish person I am, I didn't do it. <laughs> I was just like, oh, they got it. They got it up here. They could get it down. I think they actually moved them up 10 floors to the 22nd room, is what I heard when I was leaving, but... Um, so what would you have done like if you were if you went by and they said like the guy was like oh you're going back in the room well I need you to apply some hemorrhoid cream oh. and if you do I'll give you a hundred dollars <laughs> I would have done that for a hundred dollars would you use a plastic glove not if you didn't want me to <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a pleasure thing for him he's like don't use a glove. I don't <laughs> feel skin on him, right? It's not like I would have pushed him against the wall and punched him in the stomach. What? <laughs> no, that was going to be my answer if it was something like something that I wouldn't do. I'd be like, oh, I'd push him against the wall and punch him in the stomach. Like if you said, well, if you were coming back and they actually went in the room and took the bag with my wallet in it. With my money, then I would have knocked that fucker out. So then you, you already had this going on in your mind that he stole your wallet? Yeah. <laughs> your your $22 or whatever? $22? I got more than $22. I got like $160. Oh, I thought you had, you just put your winnings in there. Yeah. Oh. What if they needed the last ingredient from you? And the only way to do it was <laughs> like... That, that would be considered cheating, so I wouldn't do it. What if he, he? What if they're like you could go in the bathroom and do it into a cup? Oh, the, fuck yeah, that's not cheating. <laughs> but the only stipulation is that the wife has to watch like oh. through a crack of the door. <laughs> I'd probably get stage fright. <laughs> like I, I'd hear her like her her dentures move in her mouth like she's sucking on her teeth, <laughs> and I'd be like. Like, go limp a little bit. Like, can you be quiet over there, Mildred? <laughs> and then she's getting all excited. She's like, uh, no. Uh, uh, uh -huh. No, I'd have to tell her. She'd have and to And she's quiet. like, tug on your ear. <laughs> no. That'd be too creepy. If they just needed the last ingredient, and I could do it my best, and I'd get paid like five hundred dollars. What if it's like, if she's like, you have to say my name <laughs> at least twice. <laughs> it's Martha. And I just be like Martha, Martha, and then <laughs> just go about my business. So that'll do it for this episode of Treasure Hunting for Nostalgia. This is Brandon. This is Brad. This is Nick. Happy hunting.